through, coming through. <laughs> Can't do this when all the chairs are set up, right? You know, right? Yeah. This has nothing to do with my message. I just had to do that because I could. <laughs> Grab my water bottle. So how's everybody doing this morning? That was fun, wasn't it? It was actually pretty safe. At least I thought it was. You know, about nine years ago, I uh, took my son, who was 16 years old, on a weekend away. It was a men's weekend. And so we just wanted to just take some time, and I just want to invest in him and just talk about what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a man of God. And so, so I just asked him, what are some men, man things you would you know, want to do? Not that these are just man things. I just asked him, what are things that he wanted to do? And one of the things he wanted to do was go mountain biking. Now, you have to understand that we only had a couple mountain bikes. We didn't ride mountain bikes. We never really been mountain biking, uh, but he wanted to go mountain biking. And so, so we grabbed the bikes and we had and we put them in the back of our van and we went down to Brown County because we found out they had some really cool mountain biking trails. How many ever rid the mountain bike trails at Brown County? Pretty cool, right? So, so we go down there. He was 16. I was in my late 40s. And so we're down there, and, you know, we, we, pulled, we're, we drove up to the top of the hill. We thought we'd just kind of go downhill. Thought it might be a little bit easier since we're just kind of beginners. So we get there, and we roll up on our bikes to this sign at the trailhead, right? And it's like when you go to a theme park, and you're getting ready to ride a roller coaster, and you're basically trying to decide whether you want to die today or not, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? They got all those things, you know, warning, warning, warning. It's all for legalities, right? Because you're probably going to die by the time you get to the end of this roller coaster or the end of this, this bike trail. So we're sitting there trying to figure out, you know, what do we do? You, do, we, do we do this or not? And there's one little sign that says, here's an easy path if you're a beginner. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's just take the easy path and just kind of just test it out just to make sure we're okay. So this little path, I don't know if you've ever taken it, it goes over to the campground. And so it's just flat, no hills, one little maybe six-inch bridge. You kind of go up and over. It was wooden. And we go over to the campground parking lot, and we're there, and we're like, well, that wasn't too bad. So we ride back, and we go back to the, the trailhead where the big sign is, and we're like just standing there, you know, straddling on our bikes trying to figure out, do we, do we do this? You know, it's like there's all these warnings and all these cautions, and we're just trying to figure it out. And while we're standing there, these four bikers come up out of the woods, you know, and they just ride up there, and there's three guys and a gal, and, and they stop, and they're like looking at us, so you guys going to go? It's like, well, we're just trying to figure it out. You know, we don't, we've never really mountain biked before, and we're just trying to figure out, you know, we're going to die, you know, in the next hour or so as we do this. And the guy's like, oh, no, it's really not that bad. You know, I know it says all this, but this, and this. He goes, after all, my sister did it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, this is a man weekend, right? <laughs> I mean, I got a 16-year-old son. I got to prove something. It's like, well, if his sister did it, then surely, you know, these guys were in their 20s, right? It's like, well, if his sister did it, then surely we can do it. Surely I can do it. And so, you know, that, those were just like fighting words, you know. It was like we had to prove ourselves. So, so we did. We start down the trail, and it, it started off really good. It was really fun, you know. It was just this nice, smooth path for about 20 seconds. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're flying down this hill and we're heading into this curve and it's a really tight bend and, and the cleft of the, the mountain, you know, the hills down there. And I get down to the bottom and all of a sudden, you know, I'm in, I'm in the lead, you know, my son's behind me. And all of a sudden I realize in this instant that they embedded stone in the curve on the side of this hill that's sticking up. And that there was no way I could stop or slow down. And all of a sudden, going around the curve, it's like they're trying to kill us. This is crazy. Who would embed these stones in this path? And then it was just one crazy thing after another. There were these wood things sticking up and this really tough bridge to go over. And there was one place where the only way you could get through this fork in the tree uphill was to try to bunny hop over this rock that was sticking up. And we, we scuffed our ankles several times. We wiped out a couple times. I think we walked more than we rode our bikes. It was really hard. <laughs> It was, really, it was a lot harder. And when we got to the, finally, about 45 minutes later, till we got to a street, you know, there in Brown County, we like got off our bikes. We're like, oh, my gosh, our legs were burning. We're sore. It's like, that girl was tough. <laughs> She's tough. That was not an easy path. It was a very hard path. And I think sometimes when it comes to our journey of our life, that many times it can end up like that trail. It becomes a really hard path path. 
And there's all these twists and turns and unexpected things that just hit us that we weren't, we weren't ready for, we weren't prepared for. They can just completely throw us off course. And then over time, our hearts become hardened and embittered towards the things of God and his kingdom. And so we're in this series called Seeds, and last week we kind of started looking at the parable of the soils. Many of us know it as the parable of the sower, um, but I think a better you know, definition of that parable is the parable of the soils, one of the parables that Jesus told, because the whole parable is about the soil of our heart, and what kind of soil is our heart. And so we're going to start off just by reading here in Matthew chapter 13. Parables was a common way that Jesus taught Stories were just a really good way for people to remember, you know, and grasp it. And, and it was also purposely done to try to get people to really listen to what was being said and try to understand. And as Cindy shared with us last week, that when it came to this kind of a parable, it was common, common in, in Jewish teaching to have three wrong things or three bad things and one right thing. So the listeners... Jesus' audience, this crowd, would clearly understand in hearing this parable what he was implying. All right, so today we're going to be looking at the hard path, and we're going to start off just reading in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 1, and then we're just going to focus in on one section of this story. It says this, it says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. This is the part we're going to be focusing on today. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Verse 7, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. And that's really the emphasis that Jesus is after, that our hearts become soil, as Cindy shared with us last week, that it produces a crop, a bumper crop. That the seed of, of, this, of God's word just penetrates the soil of our hearts and grows to this abundant crop in our lives. Verse 9, Jesus says this, which he often said as he was telling stories and giving illustrations about the kingdom. He says, whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, now how many of you think that everybody had a set of ears in the crowd? <laughs> All right. So probably everybody had ears, right? So he's saying, are you listening? I love the way the message says, are you listening? Are you really listening is what Jesus is implying here. Now, many times as we hear the word path or read the word path in the scriptures, it's, it's often referred to as something good, right? So when we read like Psalm 119, it says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and what? Yeah. And a light unto my path, right? So many times the path, we want to make sure we're on the right path. But in this particular story, the path is not a good place. It is not a good place. It's a very vulnerable place. So I want to put up a picture. We showed a picture last week. I'm going to show a different picture that just kind of illustrates these four things that Jesus is talking about. So we see here on the far your left um, here, this is kind of the wheat harvest. It was a common crop to grow in this region, all right? And so the crop, obviously, it's got a bumper crop going here. It's not obviously harvest time yet. It's still green. And then along the side, once the crop began to grow, would be the place where the farmer would walk. And this right here is where it's just kind of matted down, and it just becomes hardened, and that's the path. That's where the path is. And then next to the path is this rocky area. Often, you know, oftentimes as we're clearing out, you know, your garden, you know, you, what, you move the rocks to the side, right? You get them out of the soil so that they don't hinder, you know, as you're trying to cultivate the soil and everything. And oftentimes over in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, there, there were, it was a very rocky area. And there were a lot bigger rocks that would be there. Um, and they often divided the farm fields from one guy's field to another person's field. And so then next to the rocks is where all the thorns grew and the weeds grew. Because there was no attention really given to that section of the field because that was kind of the dividing part. There was no, no crop or anything growing there. So there's these four sets of, of soils that Jesus is referring to as he's telling the story. And those that were there in the crowd, he's probably in a cove sitting out on a boat, they clearly understood this story. And that there was only one place that was good soil. 
And so we're going to just kind of focus in on this one part of the path that we're going to look at here. Because the seed fell in what Jesus is saying is in a very vulnerable place. A place where the birds could easily get the seed. Because what a farmer would do is he would carry a bag with seeds in it and he would just sow the seed. And this is where we get the term broadcasting. All right? We hear about radio and TV, but this is where we get the term broadcasting. They would just cast the seed out of that bag and some of it would fall on the path. Right? And so birds just have this knack for finding seed. How many of you ever planted grass seed in your front yard and put straw over it? And, and it's, like, it's like there's just like this, this alarm that goes off that the birds can hear, right? Because like they just immediately, like within five minutes, they're there eating the seed. And it's like, get out of my yard, right? It's like I'm trying to grow this thing. But they, they have a snack for finding it. And so Jesus is saying that this path, this hard path, is a very vulnerable place for the seed to land. Now, as Michael, as Michael and I we were riding our bikes down that path, it was, I mean, it was, it was trampled down. It was hard. <laughs> and in places, it was really hard because they purposely put stone embedded in the path. But it had been ridden over and ridden over. There was no vegetation growing anywhere around it because it had been walked on. It had been ridden on. It had been trampled down. And so Jesus is telling us here that this is not a good place for the seed to land in this hardened soil. And then he goes on to explain it in verses 18 and 19. He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Verse 19, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Like immediately, as we, as we see, we put that grass seed or some kind of seed that's just sitting there, even though we work the soil, you know, we kind of loosen up. As soon as we put that, that grass seed out there, just birds just come and snatch it away. And Jesus is saying it's very vulnerable when our hearts become hard because the enemy, the evil one, can come and snatch away the seed. And so here in this story here, when it comes to the path, all right, so hopefully you kids are counting, those of you at home counting, all right, you're going to get all these words, path, 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 path. <laughs> I know that I'm a very cruel person. So when it comes to this, this path, Jesus is saying this, is that some hearts are like the hardened path that we've been trampled on. We've, we've experienced things that have just hardened our hearts, right? And so there's just parts of our, our heart or all of our hearts just becomes closed off to the things of, of God and his kingdom and the word of God, which is the seed. And the second issue that Jesus presents here is not only is that seed vulnerable, where our hearts become hardened, but there's an evil one. We have an enemy who's out to come and snatch the seed of God's word that gets sown into our lives. And so there's these two things. So what I want to do this morning is we're just going to answer two questions. One, two questions. One is, what keeps the seed of God's word from penetrating the soil of your heart? Because I think sometimes we all kind of wrestle with this from time to time throughout the seasons of life. What is it that keeps the seed of God's word from penetrating the soil of your heart? And then the second question is, what keeps us on the hard path? Because I'm telling you, as we started down that bike trail, it, it just got really rough and it got rough really quick. And I was halfway through it. I'm thinking, man, why did I ever get on this thing? This is crazy. Was not ready for that at all. And I was so bruised and banged up and wounded by the time we got to, to the end of that path. It was like, man, that was, that was really really hard. And so what is it that keeps us when it comes to our life on the hard path? And so this morning we're looking at 300 things. No, I'm just kidding. We're looking at five things. Just make sure you guys are awake. We're looking at five things this morning, just simple things that really keep us on the hard path and keep our hearts from being open to the seed of God's word. And the first thing, number one, that Jesus alludes to as he's talking to the crowds is number one is this, is that we are not really listening. We're not really listening, right? And so we all kind of experience this from time to time, right? We hear somebody talking. I mean, maybe right now, some of you hear me talking, but you're not really listening, right? I mean, we all do this, you know, especially maybe with our spouse, or usually with our family members, either our spouse or our kids, and, we're, we're, and, you know, and they're trying to tell us something, and they're talking, and, and our mind is just completely preoccupied with something else, right? And, and it's just like, wah, 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 wah. You know, you, you, know, you see that mouth moving, right? And, and, you know, and your kid's just like, come on, come on, please let me do this. And you're, you got all this stuff on your mind because it's a rough morning or something. And you're not even thinking about what they're saying. It's like, are you even listening to me? Yeah, I heard everything you say. What did I say? Oh, you said something about a bike, you know, some seed or something. It's like, see, you weren't even listening to me. 
And so what Jesus is addressing here is that obviously we can hear the person talking, right? But we're not really listening. Our hearts and our heart posture is not really attentive to the things of God and of his word. And so this is what Jesus is addressing here is that we're not really listening. We can hear, obviously, he's saying everybody's got an ear to hear, let him hear. It's like, well, Jesus, we all have ears, but are we really listening? Now, I just remember that day when we went riding on, our, on that bike trail, as we're standing there straddling our bikes, trying to figure out if we're going to do it or not, because the first one was really easy, but the way they're making this other one sound, it's going to kill us. And those four bikers showed up, and they're asking us questions, so you guys going to do it? And we're sitting there just trying to figure the whole thing out. I only remember one thing that that guy said that whole morning. You know what it was? My sister did it. That's all I remember. Because everything else, I mean, my mind just went completely somewhere else in that moment. I'm sitting there looking at my arms. I'm looking at my legs. I'm trying to decide, do I have what it takes? Right? I mean, that's all I'm thinking about is my sister did it. My sister did it. And it's like, I just stopped listening. I could hear him talking, but I didn't hear anything else after that. And then sure enough, we just dive right in. Let's go back and look at verse 19. This is what Jesus says. He says, when anyone hears, so obviously they're hearing. I mean, could you imagine being there and hearing the Son of God, seeing him in person, sitting out there on that boat on the lake, and hearing the very words of God coming from God the Son? I mean, what a moment it would be, right? Right? But Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are all sitting here and you're all listening to this huge crowd, but there's some of you that you're really not listening. And he says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is one of the issues he's saying that happens here. And this is the seed that's sown along the path. This path that gets trampled down and becomes hardened. And so what happens when we're not listening is that the evil one just comes. And immediately, even though we can kind of hear the words going on, the evil one just wants to come and just snatch that word of truth right out of our hearts. And so what I want to do today is we're just kind of, kind of look at how the evil one can work at snatching the word out of our hearts. And so the first bullet point I want to come put up here is that the evil one, and what Jesus is telling us here is that the evil one, he comes to snatch away the truth sown in your heart. So this is a challenge that we're up against when the seed of God's word is cast and we hear it. Is that immediately the enemy wants to come and snatch it away from us. And our hearts, when they become you know, hardened, what, what the enemy wants is he just wants it to become a, a hardened wasteland. He doesn't want it to produce anything. He doesn't even want the seed of God's word to have a chance to produce anything in our lives. He wants our lives and our heart to continue just to be trampled on and become this hardened path so that we become just a, our life just a waste and a wasteland and we just continually live in brokenness. And this is why it's so important that you've heard me say over and over again that we were regularly spending time in God's word. Whether you use a paperback Bible or I I use my my, my phone, I use YouVersion. You've heard me say over and over again, download the YouVersion app. Have a daily devotional, daily spend time in God's Word. Why? Because immediately when we hear it and we take it in, the enemy wants to come and snatch it. And if all we do is, is Jesus saying, if all we do is just hear, and the real question is, are we really listening all right? In order to have a grip on God's word, if all we do is have one pinky of trying to hear, then we don't have a grip on God's word, and the enemy can just come and easily snatch it right out of our hands, right out of our hearts. But if we hear, and we read, and we study, and we memorize, like our kids are memorizing it. Isn't it funny? Our kids can memorize scripture, <laughs> right? And then we meditate on it. We do all five of those things, then we can have a solid grip on God's word. And when the enemy comes and tries to snatch it out of our hearts, he doesn't have a chance because we have a solid grip on the word of God, which Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, it's the sword of the spirit. It's our offensive weapon. And so we need to have all five of those things. And that's why we just try to challenge you to get in one of our life groups. And they're all meeting on Zoom right now. So for our young adult group, I think they're meeting in person now because they're under 25, as most of them are. But but it's just there's just this opportunity we can get into God's word. We can meet together. We can study God's word together to just eliminate the enemy from snatching it out of our hearts because we all go through difficult challenges throughout the journey 
of life. And that trail had so many unexpected twists and turns. I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it was, and it was very challenging. And so the enemy wants to come and just rob us and steal that, that seed of God's word right out of our hearts. And oftentimes what happens is because what we do, what Jesus is implying, is we just become superficial hearers. The seed never penetrates the soil of our heart because we just kind of keep our, our faith at this superficial level. And it just gives the enemy an opportunity to, to steal it. Our hearts are not tilled soil, ready for the seed to take plant and to grow. Which then brings us to the second thing. The second thing that often keeps us, that allows the enemy to come and snatch that seed. Number two is that oftentimes, you know, we're, we're not really listening. And then we, we start to think that we know what's best. Right? And this is kind of this thing where pride starts to kick in. Right, And so, so you know, we're, Michael and I were sitting there on our bikes trying to figure out if we're going to do this thing. And then when this guy says, hey, my sister did it, it's like, well, pff, I'm a man. <laughs> if your sister did it, then I don't think it's women. I'm just saying, like, if your sister did it, you know, this guy's guys think sometimes. Like, if your sister did it, then surely I can do it. You know, and i got to prove myself because I have my 16-year-old son with me. Right? So all of a sudden, you know, the enemy starts whispering in our ears. And all of a sudden, this pride kicks in. And what he wants us to do is he wants us to take our focus off of God and get our focus on ourselves, right? Start thinking about me, who I am, what I can do, what I think is right, what I think is best, how I think I can do something, rather than focusing on what is true. And one of the ways that he comes and snatches a seed, the second thing Scripture calls him, this, this evil one, is the tempter. All right, And the tempter, he wants you to be self-focused and rely on your own power. I can do this. I wasn't 50 yet, all right? I'm still thinking I'm invincible. <laughs> i got to prove myself to my 16-year-old son. I can do this. I have what it takes. If she can do it, I can do it. And he comes and he starts speaking. Now, this is just for analogy purposes only, right? There's nothing wrong with riding a bike down the bike trail and wiping out, right? Hopefully you live to get to the other end. I'm just using it for an analogy. But the tempter comes and tries to trip us up. And so we see a great example where this term comes from is in Matthew chapter 4. Right? How sly the evil one is. And this is when Jesus, so he's beginning to start his public ministry, and the Spirit of God leads him out to the wilderness. He's out there for 40 days and 40 nights. All right, another time we see that's significant is when Moses is up on the mountain where Moses receives the law, all right, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law from God. He's up there for 40 days and 40 nights fasting. And so through Moses, we get the law, but Jesus is ushering in grace, this amazing grace and salvation by faith in him. And so Jesus is out in the wilderness where, where God is the Father. He's just spending time with God the Father. And it says angels are ministering to him. He's out there fasting and praying. And then right in this vulnerable moment as he's fasting and praying, the enemy shows up. It says this, Matthew chapter 4. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now you'd be hungry after 40 days, right, and 40 nights. You'd be really hungry. And so it says the tempter, verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, if... All right? It's kind of like, my sister did it. If, it's kind of like these fine words, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus immediately answered. Jesus answered and says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on what? On every word. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's why it's so important that we are in God's word because even in that scenario, right after that, the enemy, the tempter, even quoted scripture back at Jesus to try to trip him up. And Jesus refuted him right back with scripture. And over, over again, Jesus said, it is written. But here in this context, the tempter, he shows up, he says, come on. If you really are the son of God, prove it. You're hungry. If you really have divine power, then look, you don't have to be hungry any longer. You can be self-sufficient. Just look at that stone right there. I mean, you're starving, buddy. Just, just tell it to become a loaf of bread, and you can eat it right now. You can just focus on yourself and prove yourself that you have what it takes to be the Son of God, if you really are the Son of God. 
right? And so he's just very sly. Jesus knew who he was, and he knew the truth of God's word. And, and so the enemy just tries to slip in these, these little temptations. If you really think you have what it takes, just prove it. I mean, you've got to prove yourself in this moment. I mean, this is, a, this is a man weekend. You're trying to prove to your son what it is to be a man. If you really are a man, then prove it by going down that path. Right? And we start comparing. I mean, I'm looking at that guy, and I'm like, is she a bodybuilder? <laughs> Right? And we start comparing ourselves to other people. I mean, how could she do it? I mean, you know, is there something different about her that would make her any better than me? You know, we start comparing ourselves to other people. We get our focus. He gets our focus off of God and he gets our focus on ourselves and start comparing ourselves with other people. And all of a sudden, as he's trying to trip Jesus up, he convinces us to become self sufficient. I can do this. And off we go, boom, 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 just banging our heads, wiping out, just having this, just going down this hard path in life because we take our focus off of God and get it on ourselves. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes when we're diving into God's word, there's some, there's some things in, in, in Scripture that just are, are challenging, right? I mean, there's just this part of our, our fleshly nature that just thinks sometimes, you know, it would just be so much easier if I just didn't live the crucified life. Right? Like Paul says, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And sometimes we think, you know, it would just be a whole lot easier if I just took matters into my own hand. I really only need a little bit of Jesus in my life. I really need a little bit of God's word in my life. And I think I can just handle the rest on my own. And, you know, and, and if I get, you know, kind of stuck in a section on this path that I'm going down and I, and I roll my bike and I break my leg or something, then, then, then I can ask God to come help me. Right? And I'm just using that for analogy, but I think sometimes the enemy just tries to trip us up and think, you know, just become self-sufficient. You've got what it takes, and our focus becomes on us. And the tempter convinces us that the hard path is best. The hard path will be better when it's not. It's learning to trust God and living not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And as we were going down that trail, it got hard really quick. And I think sometimes in the journey of life, when we run into those hard bumps and turns, it jars us. Things end up happening very different than we expected them to. And in those moments, the enemy just starts to, to throw just voices and tempt us and get our focus off of God and focus on ourselves. And, and, and our marriage didn't turn out the way we hoped it would. Our, our kids didn't turn out the way we hoped they would. This, this work situation didn't turn out the way I hoped it would. And in this moment, our hearts gets easy for them to become hardened. And the truth of God's word, the enemy just wants to come and snatch it right out of our hearts in those moments when we start focusing on ourselves. Which brings us to the third thing of how the enemy comes to snatch away the truth of God's word. Number three is then we start believing the lies. It's this progression that starts to take place, right? We start believing the lies, all right? Now, another next bullet point here is that the scripture shows us that the father of lies, who our enemies refer to, his goal is he wants you to believe lies, not truth. He wants to convince us that the lies are true. And it gets us to focus and believe these lies, not what's true. And we see a great example of this in John chapter 8, verse 43 through 45. Jesus here is confronting the religious leaders, those that knew the word of God, that were teachers of the word of God, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious Jewish leaders of the day. And he says this to them. He says, why can't you understand what I am saying? It's because you can't even hear me. Now, Jesus is kind of throwing out some fighting words here, right? Obviously, they're sitting there saying over and over again, it's like, we hear everything you're saying, Jesus. It's like, no, you don't. You're not really listening. That's what he's implying. Verse 44, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and what? The father of lies. Now you see, the religious leaders were out to kill Jesus because they didn't like what he had to say. They didn't like the message of the kingdom. They were more sold out and bought into their traditions and how they did things. And they were really sold out to pride and position. 
and control. And Jesus comes along and he just completely blows their paradigm, blows it up. He says, no, you're, 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 you're constantly looking at these people that are hurting and wounded and you're, you're saying, well, you're in this situation here because you're a sinner. You're going down and you're stuck in that hard path because you, you've made so many mistakes in your life. Your parents probably did it and you're just reaping the consequences and you live in a whole line of sinners and you're never going to come off the hard path. Well, we know that Jesus came to set us free, right? We just sang about it. He came to get us off the hard path. And one of the lies that the enemy wants to throw at us when we start running into the, the hard bends and turns and, and the rocks and the, the rough places in this journey that we're on on this path is that it's safer when you are in control, right? It's a lot safer when I can be in control because when I'm in control, then everything's going to turn out exactly the way I want it to because I'm going to control the situation. How many control freaks do we have in the room here? <laughs> Right? It's easy to do, right? It's easy to do. And in that moment, as Michael and I were riding down this path, I thought I was in control until all these crazy things started showing up in the middle of the path. And I see for me, it was a hard decision because one of the fears that I've always had to battle through throughout my life is the fear of failure. Do I really have what it takes? And over and over again, even though you know, I went to a performing arts school as a kid and performing, I mean, when I was playing my horn, my knee would shake. I was so nervous. You know, because it's just constant thought, what are other people going to think about me? Right? What if I make a mistake? And then when, you, when you're in ministry, you know, there's this, there's this fear. It's like when we, we started this church four and a half years ago, it's like, what if it doesn't work? What if nobody comes? What if I fail? And so it's so easy just to, to want to be cautious. I mean, if it was my decision, I probably would have walked the bike all the way down the path. <laughs> it's safer. I can be in control. And the enemy just constantly is whispering these lies and these moments when life comes at us, like this, this pandemic that we're in right now. There's just so many things that are, that are out of our control. And God wants us to learn to trust him. And so what did I do when we're there at the trailhead? We're sitting there trying to figure out reading this sign. And these, these four people show up. And this guy's talking to us, you know, and bragging about his sister. You know, I'm, I'm like asking him as many questions as I can. Okay, okay, so, so what was it like? Okay, so what, what, what were some of the things on the path? You know, I'm trying to figure out. Because if I can figure it all out ahead of time, then it's going to be easy, right? I know what to expect. There's no faith involved. There's no real trust involved. I'm, I'll have it all figured out so it'll be safe. Right? And so I'm asking him all these questions, trying to figure it out. And the real thing I just wanted to know is, will I get hurt? Right? Now let's be honest, none of us in this life ever want to get hurt. Right? But how many in this room have ever been hurt before? Right? I mean, we've all been hurt. And, and the enemy just wants to keep us from trusting God because we, we hit a couple bad spots in the path. It's like, you know what, I'm not going to go down that path again because I'm not going to get hurt again. And all these bad habits and all these things begin to, to fester and lies and everything the enemy throws at us, and all of a sudden our heart becomes the hardened path. If I can be in control, as long as my heart's hardened, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm not going to get hurt again. I'm not going to let another person hurt me. And so we avoid taking risks. We avoid trusting God. We think we know what's best, and we try to maintain control. And this was a man weekend. I'm trying to prove to my son what it is to be a man, what it is to be a man of God, what it is to be a man physically, right? <laughs> and everything in my heart was just pounding. We're going down that path, and it's like, I'm going to die. But God wants us to take risks and trust him. But as we go through these hard things of life, our heart becomes hardened because we experience just the pain of brokenness, rejection, betrayal, broken trust, right? And our heart becomes hurt. And the enemy just wants to take that, that, the arrow where our heart's been pierced and he just wants to kind of work it around and continue to whisper lies and tempt us. Just, just maintain control. Don't open your heart to God because if you let the seed of God's word penetrate your heart, it's going to get harder. And he wants us 
to keep our hearts hardened towards God. And then as we head down the path, then there's this big looming question. What if God doesn't show up? What if I take this risk and I, and I step out in faith and what if God doesn't show up? And then there's a big looming question there. Can God really be trusted? Right? Because that's really what we're asking. Can God really be trusted when we're not willing to take a step in faith and trust him? Is God's word really true? Is all of a sudden in this moment we're, we're asking this. And the enemy wants to keep us on the hard path. And not allow the seed of God's word to take root. Which brings us to the fourth thing. Is then we begin to focus on our failures. He gets us to focus on our failures. We start believing the lies. He tempts us to trust in ourselves. All this pride starts to kick in. And then we start to focus on the failures. Now looking back on that day, you could look at that day two different ways. I was not, we did not do great on that trail at all. It was, it was really hard. We, did, we didn't mountain bike. You know, we've never mountain biked since then. I mean, he has, but I haven't. And it's not because of that trail. It's just that, you know, he actually, you know, my bike's actually broken hanging in my garage from another trip. But, but you know, we, we never really mountain bike. But that's not the reason we've never been back. We just haven't been back. But when looking at that day, we could say, we could sum it up two ways. We could say, man, that was just a blast. You know, two, two guys just being crazy like guys are and just wiping out and doing crazy things together and then getting to the, to the opening there at the, at the road and just laughing. He's like, man, that girl was tough <laughs> because that path was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And we just had a great time connecting together, doing something crazy together. Or I could look at it and say, man, I failed. I wanted to prove that I had what it took. I still had it as a man. And I had to get off my bike so many times and walk it. And then there was a couple times where I, I nicked my ankle on that tree as we were passing it. because goes, I have them so close to the side of the path. Come on, can't somebody cut those things down? Then my ankle doesn't have to nip that thing. And then, you know, these choice words come out of my mouth. Right? Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I welcome suffering and pain. It just makes me stronger. Which brings us to this next bullet point here is the accuser. And then he starts accusing us. And the accuser wants to keep you focused on your failure. You see, you failed, Jim. As you banged your ankle, you wiped out. And in that moment, I don't know why it is in those moments, sometimes those words you don't want to say come out of your mouth. And you call yourself a pastor. You call yourself a godly role model for your son that you're trying to spend a weekend with to show him what it is to be a man of God. And the enemy just starts throwing. He gets us to try to focus on our failures. Revelation chapter 12, where we get this term from, verse 10 it says, this is John as he's on the island of Patmos, and he has this revelation. He says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. See, we know who wins in the end, right? But, but, but John gives us this picture that we have an accuser who goes before God day and night accusing us. You see your servant Jim that you called to start that church? He's a failure. He's a sinner. Did you see the way he talked to his wife the other day? Did you see the way he, he did this or he said that and did that? And you let him be a pastor? You, you think he's just, and, he, and he goes before God, he tries to accuse us, and then he goes and he, and he gets us to focus on our failures. And then what happens over time is this, this hardness of our heart begins to grow and we know that we fail and we start focusing on it. Then you know what? We buy into his games. And we become accusers of the brothers and sisters. Right? You see, I wouldn't have been in that situation if that guy wouldn't have said those words. Right? I would have never went down that path. My life would have been perfect that day. But that guy just had to say, my sister did it. And he convinced me that path was easy. It's his fault that I got hurt. 
It's his fault that I, I said those words. Oops. It's your fault that this fell off that table. <laughs> right? I mean, we start pointing fingers and blaming other people for our brokenness, our hurts. And rather than just humbly going before God, as Scripture calls us to, we start becoming like our enemy. When our hearts become hardened and we start accusing others, it's their fault. That's why I'm in this situation that I'm in. And we start to gossip and slander and all these things that just continue to make our hearts even harder. Which brings us to the last thing, number five. What happens is ultimate goal is that we get robbed. We get robbed. I mean, he wanted to rob us of that day. He wanted to rob us of that weekend. We had a great time together, regardless of all the times we, we may have wiped out and had to get off our bikes and walk it through just some of the difficult things. We had a great time together, but the enemy wants to rob us. He wants to steal, as Jesus says, to snatch the seed of God's word from our hearts. And this is what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 23. He says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, Say, not, not of a seed that's going to rot and decay. No, you've been born, again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. You see, the Scriptures tells us that the Word of God is alive. We have the greatest potential of the seed of the Word of God to spring forth life in us. God, the Son, who is referred to as the living Word of God. It is the greatest potential, the enduring, sustaining Word of God is alive in us. It will get us through anything and everything. Even this crazy scenario that we're in now, in the midst of this pandemic, we need God's Word. It is the promises of God that are trustworthy and the enemy wants to come and snatch away the truth of God's word from our hearts. Why? Because this next bullet point, because he is a thief. He's a thief. And the thief wants to rob you of the fullness of God. All that God has for us in Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 10, this is what Jesus teaches his disciples. He said, the thief has a purpose. And his purpose is just what he tells in that parable, is to steal and to kill, and to destroy. He wants to make our lives a wasteland and to keep us on the hardened path. But Jesus said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And the enemy is focused on just taking the word of truth and snatching it out of our hearts so that our lives just get stuck in the hardened path. But Jesus said, I have come to give you a rich and satisfying and abundant life. And the greatest potential in all of eternity is the living word of God and his word that can be alive in us to bring the fullness of life to us and give us that rich and satisfying life. No matter what we go through, Jesus came to give us life and the fullness of it. And so in just wrapping up, in James 1, 22, we looked at Study, we did a study of James last year, and James wrote this. He says, but just don't listen to God's word, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Are you listening? All right, so then we get to that point where we're listening, right? He says, but just don't listen to God's word. You must do what? He says, you must do what it says. We have to put it into motion, right? So if this, this bicycle represents our spiritual life, how many pedals do you need to make this bicycle to move? You need both of them, right? And so what are the two pedals that we need? Know the word, do the word. Know the word and do the word. And that's what Jesus is saying. If we, our hearts are going to become good soil for the seed of God's word to take plant and grow a bumper crop of the fullness that all that God has for us. We've got to be intentional on listening, but it's more than just listening. We've got to Know the word and do the word. Know the word and do the word so that our hearts can reap a harvest a hundredfold more, right? Let's pray.